All right, so when I was hurrying before lunch, I, uh, I, I did something very improper. There's, there's a proper way to lift a box and an improper way, and there's a proper way to distribute, and, of course, an improper way to distribute. So when I distributed the negative 2 to the first term, I failed to do so in the second term. So really, uh, that should be a plus 2, and uh, that doesn't change the fact now that as b goes to infinity, the first term goes to 0. Uh, but now we're left with not 1, but 2. We got a bonus 1 if you will. And I don't know if I would have done it, but uh, it, you could, if you are practicing, of course, on your worksheet, you can always check your answer. So what I did is I typed in of the integral, not from 1 to infinity, but I went to 99,999, which, which is pretty far down the line of x to the negative 3 halves. And if I hit enter, it should be something close to 2. Uh, uh, 1.9936, so yeah. If I had put one down, at least I would have caught it because I, I realized it has to be bigger than one. Okay, so two is definitely correct. So once again, we have a region that looks very, very, very similar. It is unbounded. It goes on forever and ever and ever, but yet it does have a finite area of two square units. Pretty cool. Okay, so the word that we use here, and I've already been using them, is converge. Okay, what does the word converge mean? To join or come together. Yeah, so two roads converge if they come together. We're saying that the values converge upon two. They're getting closer and closer and closer to, they're approaching two. Kind of the idea of the limit. Uh, the antonym of converge would be diverge. And to use that term in mathematics, the very first one that we said equaled infinity we would say that that one diverges. If something goes to infinity, we'll say it diverges. If it approaches a finite actual value, we'll say it converges to that value. So kind of two words that we'll be using the rest of the year, converge and diverge. All right, so um, one over x to the 3 halves converges to a finite area of 2. So now I have the graph of 1 over x squared from 1 to infinity. Guess what the graph of 1 over x squared looks like? It's your volcano graph, but in the region we're working with, it looks almost identical to 1 over x to the 3 halves. Which one goes to the x-axis faster, though, for large values of x? 1 over x to the 3 halves or 1 over x squared? x squared, right? Good. Because the larger the denominator uh, gets, the faster it goes to 0. So x squared goes to the x-axis faster than x to the 3 halves. So with that in mind, do you anticipate this area from 1 to infinity converging or diverging? Diverging? If 1 over x to the 3 halves essentially went to the x-axis fast enough to converge to the value of 2, then shouldn't something that goes to the x-axis faster also converge? Yeah, what, the, the way it diverges is, is if it goes to the x-axis very lazily, like 1 over x to the first in the very beginning, uh, then it's, it's not going to um, cause the paint to, you know, pool or, or clog the hole, if you want to think about that analogy. So the faster it goes to the x-axis, the more likely it's going to converge. So this one should converge. But to what? I don't know. Should it be less than 2 or greater than 2? If 1 over x squared goes to the x-axis faster, it should be a little bit less than, right? Let's, let's see. Um, to integrate it again, we have to use the right notation. So it's going to be the limit as b goes to infinity, the integral from 1 to b of x to the negative second. And again, on a free response, that's what you have to write. Hello, good morning, welcome. If Mitch would like to be borrowed. Yes, he says yes. Sorry, Mitchell. I guess if they wanted Mitchell, they would have said Mitchell, not just Mitch. All right, so the antiderivative then of x to the negative second is x to the negative first with the negative 1. Evaluate it from 1 to b. And uh, we just rewrite the limit each time, right? So I'll keep the negative out front again, and this time I'll try to distribute correctly. When you plug it in, you get b to the negative first, which is 1 over b, minus 1 to the negative first, which is just 1. Now, let me evaluate it before 
I distribute. Remember the limit, you could just stick it anywhere you need it, wherever you have a variable. What happens to 1 over b as b goes to infinity? It gets smaller and smaller approaching 0. And so 0 minus 1 is negative 1, and negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1. So there you go. Our conclusion was right on spot. It does converge as well because it goes to the x-axis faster than x to the 3 halves, 1 over. And it converged to something smaller than 2, in this case, 10. And that brings us to part C, 1 over x cubed. Which one goes to the x-axis faster for large values of x? 1 over x squared or 1 over x cubed? Cubed. So this one should also converge to a finite number, and it should be what in relation to 1? Less than 1. Okay. So same idea. Now, let me work this one from a multiple choice perspective. On the free response, the evaluation has to come from a limiting process, okay? So in other words, you have to rewrite the limit. But on a multiple choice where your work is not graded, or if you're an IL-4 of HEB and you're just doing it on your own, no one's going to question your notation, right? Let's just go ahead and see how we would do this maybe uh, outside of a free response. X to the negative third from 1 to infinity. I'm going to leave it as infinity. It's only the antiderivative. It's x to the negative second and then a negative 1 half in front. But I'm just going to leave it from 1 to infinity. What the heck? Now I'm going to plug in, leaving the negative 1 half out front. I get infinity to the negative second, which is really 1 over infinity squared, bless you, minus 1 over 1 squared, which is 1 over 1. Now this would cost you points on the AP exam. 1 over infinity squared makes no sense, really. But in slang, we kind of know what it means, right? What happens to 1 over infinity squared? It goes to 0, right? And 0 minus 1 then is negative 1, and negative 1 times negative 1 half is positive 1 half. So you wouldn't have to do the extra notation of the limit. It's really the same idea, but there's no limit to be had here, and so you would lose a point. So there you go. It did converge, and it converged to something smaller than a half. Now the follow-up question here is, uh, do you see any patterns? When the exponent was 1.5, the area converged to 2. When the area was, or the exponent was 2, it converged to 1. When the area was 3, or the exponent was 3, the area was 1 half. Do you see a relation between the exponent on the x, and or the, the power on the x, and the actual area to which it converged? You do? What do you see? Yeah, the, the, there is a relation, right? The higher the power, the smaller the area, and that makes sense. It's it's uh, by pattern, I guess. Do you see like a way to compute the value of the area just by knowing what the exponent is? There is a pattern. It's not that easy to find. Let's look at the box down below. Let's just say that we're stuck. You want a fact? Yeah. Math is fun. You want another one? There's one in the box here. All right. It says if A is greater than zero, then the integral from A to infinity. So in the examples we just worked, A was one. But A can be any positive number. As long as you're going to infinity, then any function of the form 1 over x to the P, where P is the power on the x in the denominator, we say that it converges to a finite number if P is greater than 1. And it diverges to infinity if the power is less than or equal to 1. So that right there answers the question, where's the cutoff between convergent and divergent? Remember up here, we started with 1 over x to the what power? It was really 1 over x to the first power. The rule, the fact that we just read, said that this then becomes the cutoff. Anything that goes to the x-axis faster than 1 over x, that is, if the exponent on the x is anything bigger than 1, including 1.00001, 1. then apparently that's going to make it go to the x-axis fast enough to converge to some finite number. But if the power on the x is a 1, as in this case, or smaller, like a 1 half, 1 over the square root of x, for instance, 
then that is not going to go to the x-axis fast enough, and it is going to diverge to infinity. Both cases have unbounded regions, but it converges if the power is greater than 1, and it diverges if it's uh, 1 or smaller. Okay? Now, there is a special case here, like the ones we saw above. If you're starting at 1, that is if A happens to be the number 1, then if your power is greater than 1, of course, it's going to converge. But not only will it converge, you can actually determine to what it converges without actually finding the antiderivative. It converges to the value 1 over P minus 1. Do you want to memorize that? You don't really have to. How hard was it to actually evaluate these? Not that bad. But let's see. It is a nice little pattern. So in this case, 3 halves is greater than 1, so it converges. We're going from 1 to infinity, so apparently this converges to 1 over p minus 1. Well, in this case, p is 3 halves. Let's see if it works. It would be 1 over 3 halves minus 1. What's 3 halves minus 1? 1 half. What's the reciprocal of a half? 2. Is that what we got down here? Yep. All right, letter B. 2 is the power. It's greater than 1. We're going from 1 to infinity. It should converge to 1 over P minus 1. In this case, though, P is 2. 2 minus 1? One? 1. The reciprocal of 1? Uno. Yeah. And as you can imagine, it works over here as well. It's 1 over 3 minus 1, which is 1 half. So it works. So not necessary to memorize that but just kind of a neat little observation. What's important, though, is to realize that P being 1 is the cutoff for convergence, divergence. 1 or smaller diverges, bigger than 1, anything, it will converge as long as we're starting at some positive number. Why can't we start at 0? What would the integral be if we did this? What if we started not at 1, but we went from 0 to infinity? Would that work? Yeah, now we have we have a horizontal asymptote going out to the right, and now we're trying to start at the vertical asymptote, and we're going to run into really the same problem in the region between the graph and the vertical asymptote. And that's another thing that can make an integral improper when you're integrating through a vertical asymptote or with a vertical asymptote as one of your intervals of integration. Well, e to the negative x, you could start with 0 because it's defined there. Yeah, it doesn't have a vertical asymptote there. But we'll, we'll look at examples like that later on in this section. We'll deal with them kind of the same way. It depends on how fast the graph goes to the vertical asymptote, which will determine whether or not this piece here um, is finite or infinite. But right now, we're just going to look at some positive number. We're staying to the right of the vertical asymptote. And as long as the power, then, is greater than 1, it will converge. All right. Um, Note, for those with fancy, with a fancy for bathroom humor, anyone here loves scatological humor? Is that your favorite brand of humor? Shouldn't be. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting to note, though, that the convergence and divergence of something in the form 1 over x to the p, which later on is going to become called the p series, p for power, that the convergence or divergence of something that involves a p series is so heavily dependent on the number 1. Kind of interesting. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if that helps you remember it, but, yeah, the number one. Uh, um, if it's one or smaller, diverges, greater than one, converges. That's okay. All right, so very quickly here, let's do example three. If the uh, integral, if the improper integral diverges, we're going to say so, and if it converges, we're going to find the value to which it converges. Example three, the integral from one to infinity of one over x to the two-thirds, converges or diverges? diverges, okay? To what does it diverge? Things can really diverge to one of two things, infinity or negative infinity. This one's going to diverge to infinity. Okay, in other words, it's an unbounded region, but it's also infinitely largely unbounded. Wow. Um, 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the 1.1. Converges, yeah, to what? 10, 1 over p minus 1. You can use a little formula. Avoid having to integrate it. Yeah, and then 1.1 minus 1 is 0.1, which is a tenth. The reciprocal of a tenth is 10. So 
Notice it's slightly bigger than one. One is the cutoff. It doesn't go much faster than one, but it does go fast enough to converge to 10. Um, 1 to infinity of x to the negative 7. Well, let's see, that's not in the right form, so if you want to put it in the right form, that would be 1 over x to the positive 7, and now it's 1 over x to the p. It has to be in the form 1 over x to the p, and that would be what? Diverges or converges? This one converges. Yeah, 7 is greater than 1, so it converges to 1 over 7 minus 1. It converges to just 1 sixth. Yeah. Uh, let me throw this one in here. What would be the integral from 1 to infinity of just x to the 7? Bonus 1. Huh? Yeah, that, that majorly diverges. Majorly. Because that's, uh, yeah, that has no chance at converting. Because that one doesn't even go to 0, does it? The graph of x to the 7 looks kind of like x to the 3rd. We're going from 1 to, oh my gosh, that just, wow. That gets infinitely large as you go to the right. Hey, but you can still use a little form if you want. That's the same as 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the negative 7, if you want to do it that way. And is not negative 7 less than or equal to 1? Yes, it is. So this one big time diverges. Uh, let me spell that one correctly. Diverges to infinity. All right, how about this one? 1 to infinity of 3 times x to the negative 3 halves. Uh-oh, what is the 3 doing to the graph of 1 over x to the 3 halves? Stretching it vertically by a factor of 3. Is that enough to pull it away from the x-axis so that it doesn't go fast enough to converge? No, not according to the properties of limits, because the properties of limits just say, hey, if you've got a constant multiple, just pull it out front. Throw him in the back of the truck. He's a rider. So you can evaluate the integral and then take the result and then just multiply it by 3. So 1 over x to the 3 halves, of course, does what? Converges to 1 over 3 halves minus 1, yeah, which converges to 2, so then 2 times 3 is 6. So, yeah, if without the constant multiple it converges, it will with the constant multiple, just to a number that's, in this case, 3 times bigger. If it had diverged, then the 3, of course, is not going to make any dent either. Because infinity times 3 is still infinity. All right, cool. Uh, let's try then a little bit different. Shifting gears here. Moving away from the, the P-series, which is of this form. P-series. Let me go ahead and write that. P-series. It's not really a series, but it'll come up again when we study series and sequences. And it'll be very, very similar to that. Um, okay, so just kind of a random one. Throw it out there for you. This one is proper or improper? Definitely improper, right? You have a, an infinity as an interval of integration. Let's go ahead and do it uh, free response style. Let's practice the right notation. Now, if you want, you don't have to rewrite the integral as a limit. You could just wait till you evaluate it. But I'm going to go ahead and do it from the beginning. The limit as b goes to negative infinity, the integral from b to 0. And what that allows me to do then is to rewrite my integrand in a more useful form. So rewriting it and replacing infinity or negative infinity with a b. All right, so now we focus on the integrand. I'll just rewrite the limit down here. This goes back to section 4.4. Can't expand it, so I have to use pattern recognition or u sub. 3 minus x is what we call u. Its derivative is what? Negative 1. So we're only off by a negative 1, so we'll have a correction of a negative 1. And then I'm ready for the rule of integration, which is the power rule. Blob is 3 minus x to the 1 half power. And then we multiply by the reciprocal 2. Evaluated from b to 0. So again, we'll just leave the limit out front, and I'll leave my negative 2 also up front. Let me, let me do it like that. Negative 2 beefy bracket. If I plug in the top, I get 3 minus 0, which is 3 to the 1 half, so that's just the square root of 3. Minus plug in the bottom, I get 3 minus b to the 1 half. And now I can evaluate it. 
So here's the only piece that has the B in it. So let's see what happens. If I were to plug a negative infinity here for B, I would end up with 3 plus infinity, right? What's 3 plus infinity? Infinity. But what's the square root of infinity? Infinity. Yeah. But what's the square root of 3 minus infinity? Negative infinity, right? And negative infinity times negative 2 is positive infinity. So does this in improper integral converge or diverge? It diverges. And it diverges to infinity. Something could also converge or diverge to negative infinity. So if this were a multiple choice question, you'd have to choose between negative and positive infinity. So it's important to go ahead and make sure you get the correct sign of infinity as well as you're plugging stuff in. Diverges. All right. Um, so integrals, like the ones we've seen, are called improper because they have infinity as an interval of integration. And it's possible that infinity could be both the upper and lower bound, in which case uh, you'll have to split it up. And I'll show you one like that, too. All right, let's, uh, let's go back to the one at the very beginning. I think it was the second one we worked. We concluded uh, numerically that e to the negative x from 1 to infinity converged to 0.367, which looks like it's going to be some approximation of an actual number. So now we'll revisit that problem again with the insight of how to work with this type of problem. You want to practice the notation like we're doing a free response or just say, hey, let's multiple choice style it, MC style. Let's do MC style. Okay. So uh, I'll leave the infinity intact without the limit. So the antiderivative then of e to the negative x is um, negative e to the negative x. Good. We have a correction of a negative 1, and we evaluate it from 1 to infinity. So negative, I'll factor it out front, and I get e to the negative infinity minus e to the negative first. So again, I just, as a rule of thumb, pull that out. So now it's top minus bottom. Now, e to the negative infinity would lose points because it doesn't really make sense uh, in theory, but in practice it certainly does. What is e to the negative infinity approach? Zero, because it's one over e to the positive infinity. So I have zero minus e to the negative first, which is negative e to the negative first, and a negative times a negative is a positive. So you end up with e to the negative first, which is one over e. And I'm guessing... 1 over e is approximately, what, 0.367? It sure is. It sure is. Yeah, Lacey just verified that for us. 0 0.36787944412. So that's why the calculator was getting that number when we did it for 100 and 1,000 e to the x, or e to the negative x, goes to the x-axis, how, in compared to a power function of the form 1 over x to the p? Faster or slower? Much faster. Incredibly fast, okay? Any exponential, remember, grows faster than any power function in the hierarchy. So if you have e to the negative x, it's going to go to the x-axis x -axis so fast that by the time you're out from 1 by... What, just 100 units, you're already going to be converging upon what the final answer is going to be if you go out forevermore beyond that because it, it, it plugs that hole or makes the aperture of that opening so small so quickly that the paint clogs much higher in the funnel if you want to think about it that way. Cool. All right. Um, <clears throat> We don't need to do part F because we've already kind of talked about it up above, but it's just basically showing you again how two functions that essentially have the same shape from 1 to infinity can have two dramatically different um, results. Let me go ahead and, and maybe exaggerate it. If, if I look at 1 over x, it goes like that. This is the function 1 over x, and we're looking from 1 to infinity. So notice there is a large gap right there to the right of 1. But if I look at e to the negative x, e to the negative x looks like that. And here's 1. 
And notice that I drew it going to the x-axis so quickly that uh, I have to make my uh, highlighter a little smaller just to fill it in. And I also made it kind of run into the x-axis, but we know that, in fact, it doesn't. So there's the difference. How fast it goes to the x-axis is a huge determination in whether these unbounded regions, both of which are unbounded, are finite or infinite. Pretty nifty. Okay, so how do we deal with infinite intervals of integration? We've, we've already done that. Oh, you know what I did? Why did I do that? I was, I was back up here at uh, example one. That's why, I, yeah. I'm losing track. I'm getting iPad tunnel vision here. And y'all are too polite to say anything. All right, so we're on example 5B. All right, unless you want to just go backwards and throw in another random fact from like maybe, I don't know, 5.2. I don't go that far back. All right, uh, very quickly, do you anticipate this one converging or diverging? Converging? Now, e to the x fourth is exponential what? Growth or decay? Growth. There's no negative on the x, so it's, it's exponential growth. So if I went out to the right forever, it's going to diverge pretty quickly. But what am I doing? I'm coming in from negative infinity up to zero. So it's kind of the same rules that apply going out to the left, if that's where the asymptote is. So yeah, then you would expect this one converges. So let's quickly find it. Let's do it multiple choice style since we're running out of time. Uh, the antiderivative of e to the x to the fourth is, of course, e to the x fourths. And we have to have a correction of what? A four because we generate a one-fourth derivative that we don't want. We evaluate it from negative infinity to zero. Leave the four out front. We get e to the zero minus e to the negative infinity divided by four is negative infinity. So if we evaluate it, e to the zero is one. And what is e to the negative infinity approach? Zero. Not ten, zero. So this approach is four. And that's the answer. So not that difficult. And why is this guy here again? Let's see quickly why this one diverges. Okay, we know it diverges to infinity. Let's see why. What's the antiderivative of 1 over x? ln of the absolute value of x. So if we do it multiple choice style, we get the natural log of infinity minus the natural log of 1. Well, what's the natural log of 1? 0. Well, what's the natural log of infinity? It is infinity. It doesn't get there very, very fast. But it does go up and up and up forever, and so that is why it diverges, all right? So there you go. We got through example five. We will very likely finish tomorrow if we push it. Maybe not. Have a great rest of the day.